So a question popped up just about over a week ago. Um, what is the cheapest 4K Super 35 sensor video camera that's out there? Uh, so I did a quick uh, look on the WEX website, see what comes up, and there's one model that really jumps out, and that's this model here. Now it's the JVC GY LS300. Now it's a model that I've not really shot with or knew much about, and same with JVC, I've not really had much experience shooting with them. So I mean, JVC, they do very well in the broadcast industry and they do relatively well with the fixed lens cameras as well. But in the Super 35, you know, the larger format sensors, they're not really a brand that comes to mind when you think of a workhorse for, you know, your corporate events, but also creative storytelling as well. So I got this one on loan. I've been filming with it for about a week and I really wanted to see how this thing tests out because it came out in 2015, we're in 2018 now. So is this still a worthwhile investment? And the interesting point is, when you compare it to the likes of like the Sony FS5, it's around about £2,000 cheaper. It's not far off from being half the cost at 2.5K. So does this thing really hold up in 2018? Let's find out. So over the past week, I've filmed in a tattoo parlor, I've filmed at a corporate event, and I've also taken it out and about around London just to get some test shots. And I found myself filming mostly all of the time in the UHD 4K, 8 bit 422 format. And that's 8 bit 422, not 8 bit 420, much like its competition. And it can record up to 30 frames a second at 150 megabits in this format, which again is quite a healthy bit rate when you compare it to some of its competition. What's nice about this camera as well is that it's also got cinema 4K recording capabilities. So if you need that slightly wider aspect ratio and bigger resolution, then you know that you've at least got that in camera should you need it. Now it is only up to 24 frames a second. It would be nice to have 25, but at least you've got something if you need to deliver in cinema 4K. Now if HD filming is more your thing or you tend to film in HD more often than 4K, then it's got broadcast spec 8 bit 422 at up to 60 frames per second in 50 megabits. Now if I'm completely honest, I didn't film a massive amount in HD with this camera because a lot of the time I shoot in 4K even if I'm delivering in HD because I feel like it gives me a much cleaner and more detailed image. Now the main benefit of filming in HD on this camera is really going to be for its slow motion capabilities. When you're filming in 4K, there isn't really any options internally to do any sort of slow motion effect. But if you drop it down into HD, then you can go up to 120 frames per second. Now in the standard filming modes in HD, you can go up to 60 frames per second. But when you go past 60 frames per second, for example to the 100 frames per second that you see on the screen now, there is a significant crop in, so that is definitely something to keep in mind. Now in terms of operating this camera, there are some features that I really like about it. Uh, the main one is that I've got the ability to overlay markers. Now a lot of the films that I like to shoot, I like to do in a cinemascope aspect ratio, so it's got the black bars at the top and bottom. And you can do that in camera as a preview, so I know what it's gonna look like when I get into post. It just helps me compose my shot much easier. You've also got the ability to preview your shot with a standard dynamic range LUT loaded on there when you're shooting in log, so you've got a better idea as to what your exposure is going to look like, again, when you get into the edit. And in terms of focusing, I've got the ability to expand my focus whilst I'm still rolling, so I can really just jump in, double check that I've got my critical focus nailed, and jump back out without disturbing that recording. And I can also bring up some of the focus assist tools as well, which really do help in the process of making sure you've nailed that focus. And lastly, something that I really do enjoy using is if you're shooting in HD and you're using a prime lens, you've got the ability to almost do a servo style zoom in and out. So basically what happens is it's remapping the pixels that it uses on that sensor to the zoom. And it basically means that you can zoom in, zoom out without any loss of resolution or depth of field by using a prime lens. So let's take another look at the body. I mean, at first glance, it sort of resembles the Handycam, fixed lens sort of cameras that we were used to seeing in the early 2000s, the mid 2000s. Uh, there's a slight hint of Cinecam because we've got an interchangeable lens at the front, but overall, to be completely honest, it's not the sexiest looking camera. Um, in reality though, you should be more focused on the functionalities of the camera and the actual images that it can capture. On the front, when we look at the mount, you might be surprised to hear that it takes a micro four thirds mount. There are some benefits to using this sort of mount though, because you look at the price point of this camera, this glass is typically smaller than say Canon full frame EF and Sony E-mount lenses, so therefore it's gonna be cheaper and it's gonna be lighter. 
You might also ask, does Micro Four Thirds lenses cover a Super 35mm camera? Well, the answer is pretty much most of the time, yes, they do. Uh, out of all the lenses I've got, most of them work without vignetting. This Olympus 12 to 40mm lens only vignettes at the widest uh, point of the lens, but there is some clever technology in this camera that gets you around that, and I'll move on to that in a second. But also, using Micro Four Thirds glass means that you can pretty much adapt this mount to take any lens that you want that's out there. Okay, so let's get back to how do we get around that vignetting. Well, I've kind of already touched upon the technology that's in this camera with the prime zoom feature. So basically, JBC have made this technology called variable scan mapping. And this basically allows you to maintain the native angle of view for whatever lens that you're using. For example, instead of using the sensor in full Super 35 mode, I can tell the camera to use a slightly smaller proportion of the sensor until that vignetting on that wide angle lens disappears. Now this really does make lens options for this camera limitless. And also, just to throw it in there, if you wanted to, you could always use a speed booster as well to get closer to that full frame look on this camera. So if I'm being completely honest, the build quality in this camera doesn't feel fantastic. I mean, I'm very aware of the amount of plastic that has been used to make this body, but it has got all the features that you would want. You know, you've got 10 user assignable buttons around the body. You've got a removable XLR audio handle, so you can have a more compact setup should you need it. And there are no cables needed apart from for the microphone, which is great. You've also got built-in ND filters. You've got an articulating swivel screen, which is fantastic as well if you're filming low and high angles. And you've also got dual SD card slots as well. Now, those dual SD card slots have got some nice features as well. Of course, you can just record to one card. When that fills up, it goes to the next. But you can also do dual recording, so you've got an instant backup as well. Great for professional gigs. But the last bit, which is quite interesting, is that you can set it so as soon as you turn this camera on, one of those SD card slots will just start recording and will record for as long as this camera is on. And the other one, you just trigger as usual with the record button when you want it to start and stop a shot. Now that just means that, you know, if you keep documentary filming in mind, you're never really going to miss a moment because you're always recording. But at the same time, you don't have to use that big recording should you feel like you've captured the moment with your normal start and stop trigger. Now, of course, at this sort of price point, there is clearly going to be some drawbacks to this camera. It's not going to excel in all areas, and it wouldn't be a fair video if I didn't actually say what I think are its biggest weaknesses. And there are two weaknesses that come to mind. Um, the first one is to do with the fact that you can only record 8-bit internally. Now, if you look at its competition, this sort of price point, or anywhere near this price point, they're kind of in the same place as well but I'd at least like to be able to output 10-bit, and that's something that this just can't do. It can only output 8-bit 422. Now, the second weakness, uh, which is sort of the biggest one for me, is the screen and the EVF. Uh, they're quite underpowered, they're not quite sharp, and the colors aren't quite where I'd want them to be. I know that sounds quite negative, uh, but it's good to highlight that uh, at this point, that it's not really something that I would like to use without an external monitor and for some of the shoots I've been using a small HD monitor to get around that. It's okay if you get used to it, to get your composition, but judging your exposure and everything else, I just much prefer a screen that I know is sort of calibrated and something that I'm used to. So on the back of that last negative, there is sort of room for a positive, and that's the fact that if you do use an external screen, if you opt to get an external recorder instead, such as the Atomos Inferno recorder, this can actually output 4K at 60 frames a second. So then you've now got the ability to record 4K in slow motion to make some really nice, beautiful cinematic shots. So one of the really nice uh, and unique features that this camera has, uh, considering what sort of sensor it's got in the front, is that it's got a USB port on the back. Now, obviously, USB port doesn't sound that interesting, but when you couple it with a, you know, any cheap sort of Wi-Fi network adapter, this then obviously makes the camera wireless, but what's quite cool with the camera is that it's got the possibility that it can live stream directly from this camera to any sort of content delivery network, whether that be Facebook or YouTube or whatever you prefer to use, this can encode that video and send it over Wi-Fi. So obviously we're here in uh, central London. I'm gonna get this camera attached to my personal hotspot on my phone and I'm going to use the Mac just to screen record so you can see the live stream. So the idea is that without any cables or whatnot, we're going to be able to just do a live stream to YouTube just from this bench. 
I've just pulled up the little status box on the camera so I can see the IP address, type that into my browser, and then now I can view remotely everything that this camera sees. I can also change any of the settings that I can do in camera through this web browser. So if I just flick over to the, the next tab I've got, it's my YouTube account, which has my live stream details, uh, which don't change. I've then copied them into the live stream details in this web browser. And so what should happen now is that as soon as I hit stream on the camera, I can see that it says we're now live on the camera here. And what should happen is that this should get that stream and should turn green to say that we're getting a signal from this encoder. So just give that a second to catch up. And I see it's gone green, starting stream. And now we can see the live stream from this camera. So effectively, you don't need the MacBook to do this. Once you've got your stream details already in the camera, as soon as you hit go, that will then, as long as it's got a network connection, which is through my phone, will then go to whatever content delivery network that you're using. In this case, it's YouTube, just to show you guys how it works. You could even negate using the phone and you could, instead of using a Wi-Fi dongle, use a 4G dongle that's got a SIM in there. And wherever you are, as long as you've got signal, you hit that stream button, it'll then go off to whichever provider you use and someone can just start that stream for you. Really, really powerful tool. So back to my first question. Is this camera that was released in 2015 still a good investment here in 2018? And from my time shooting with it over the past week, I would say yes, it is is. Um, obviously there are drawbacks to the camera as I've mentioned, you know, the viewfinder, the EVF uh, and also the, there's no ability to do 10-bit recording but once you look past those sort of things, um, for its price point especially, this is a very capable camera. And it does beg the, the question as to, you know, why didn't this make a big splash when it was first released in 2015? I think that's two things. One, JVC haven't really been known in the sort of creative filmmaking space. And two, when you look at all the specs that I've talked about to you today, you know, the headline specs, they weren't all there when this was released. Basically what's happened is that over time, JVC have been working in the background to get this camera to where it is now, which is where I think it is now a really competitive camera. But those specs include, you know, 4K422, the ability to output 4K60P, the inclusion of JLog, histograms, spot metering, slow motion HD up to 120 frames per second. Now these are all the, you know, the eye-catching specs that really appeal uh, from this camera. So it, I'm not surprised that it didn't make a massive impact when it was released, but now, bear in mind its cost, it is a really competitive package. Especially if you think about the streaming capabilities of this camera. So if you're a cell shooter, um, you want a, a camera on a budget that's going to be able to do the, you know, your bread and butter corporate events, your interviews. It's also going to give you that nice shallow depth of feel for your more, let's say, cinematic, uh, creative storytelling. And also you want something that's going to allow you to offer live streaming capabilities to your clients. And I think the LS300 is a really, really good option.